phone wasn't on. Hello? Yeah. Nick Johansson? Nick's not here? Okay. Chris Malfa? Uh, Nicholas Mumau? Giovanna? Not here. Pamela? Adam Smith? Joseph Sullivan? And Garrett Sermon. All right. Um, what, I, what I like to do to start off the class is um, go over the basics of how the class will be formatted and so on and spend some time looking at the syllabus and the documents and, and so on and then get into the course material um, and, and we'll go from there. So we'll start off going in that direction. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with Canvas. So I won't go over that in detail. If there's anything you don't understand about it or you have questions about, um, let me know. <clears throat> um, the course, for the most part, where the stuff I'm really going to go through today is in the syllabus tab and the modules tab. Um, I'm not going to read the syllabus to you. I don't think that benefits anyone. That, that must be really boring for you and it's not particularly exciting for me either. So I'll hit what I consider the high points and you can read all these details here and this is largely, this first part of the syllabus is largely about how to contact me. So. I'm not going to read and tell you my email address and all that, but something you should notice, and this is sort of the story behind the story. There's a lot of ways to get a hold of me, all right? There's a phone, which I guess you can use, but it's probably better to use one of the other methods like email. There's my email address. There's Skype. There's office hours. You're invited to sit in on any of my other labs, not just for this class, but like my CISS 216 lab, for example. And I'm available online via Canvas. And I can talk to you via phone, I can online chat, Skype, whatever. I point that out because that's really the message of that first part of there, is that there is a lot of ways to contact me to get your questions answered. And that's one of your biggest responsibilities as a student, especially in a class like this. Um, you know, sometimes people ask me, like, is a class easy or is a class hard? Um, I don't know if I'm the best judge of that. Um, but what I will say is that students that are diligent, that come to class, that work on the assignments, and most importantly, that ask questions when they don't understand something are generally successful. That's true in just about all my classes. Now depending on your experience and you know your past experience programming and your background and your aptitude, some things might come really easy to you and some things might come harder. But anyone that takes the time to ask me questions will get through the class and will do well in the class. So I give all these different opportunities to you. Um, because again, some of the stuff, some of the material can be challenging and some of the concepts can be challenging as well. So I try to give you a bunch of different ways to contact me um, if you need to. So again, I have office hours like right before this class. Um, I can, uh, I can uh, you know, you can come into in my other labs which uh, I can give you the full lab schedule if you have questions. In a nutshell, I have a lab on Monday and Wednesday from, uh, no, 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 from 10 to 11 a.m. And then from Tuesday and Thursday from 11.30 to 12.30. Um, so I'm available during those times. In addition to my office hours, and sort of the wild card is if none of those other times work for you, 
um, you, we can always make other arrangements. Like if you, your work schedule or something keeps you from coming in during office hours, we can always figure out uh, another time uh, <coughs> to meet. In addition, you can certainly ask questions in class. Um, there's an old adage that, you know, if you have a question, chances are a lot of other people in the class, or at least a few other people in the class have the same question. So by all means, don't hesitate to ask questions. We're not that big of a class. I don't know, we have maybe a dozen or so people in the class. And therefore, if you and a couple other people are unclear about something, well, that's a significant portion of the class. So the worst case scenario, if you ask something and I don't want to take the class time to discuss it, is I'll tell you we can talk about it during lab. So don't edit yourself and don't say, oh, I think this is a dumb question, or I think this is irrelevant, or whatever. If anything, if, if I don't think the class uh, lecture is the appropriate time to discuss it, uh, if you need additional help on something or whatever, you know, I'll just tell you, oh, let's just address that in lab. So don't, don't edit yourself. And again, there's a lot of ways to get a hold of me. Um, email is probably better than phone. Uh, and you know, in person is a good way to contact me as well. We have a whole list of the outcomes of this class. This is um, meant to be, you know, uh, this is like official language from our catalog and all that. So do read it because this does provide context and focus for the class. The material, the textbook. Um, Anyone, I imagine you all know that uh, when you work on something in the lab, um, if you uh, do not take a copy of it, um, it's gone the next time the computer reboots. So if you're using the computers in the lab, it's best to, um, to, um, best to do what? Best to save a copy of it somewhere else. Instructor approach, the bottom line is just simply reiterating what I had. This is your class. Um, and it's my job to help you understand and I provide, uh, you know, we both have responsibilities in this interaction. My responsibility is to have activities and have lectures and, and explain things and answer questions. Your responsibility is to do the readings, to, to show up, to be paying attention, to work on the labs and to ask questions. Uh, that's certainly one of the biggest uh, responsibilities that students come to this class. Um, <laughs> students deal with questions sometimes the way I deal with toothaches, you know. You know, if I have a toothache, you know, you think that like, well, if I just wait a couple weeks, it'll get better, you know. And, and, and how often does that happen? It really doesn't, right? It just gets worse. Well, well that's probably a stupid analogy, but hey, it's still early in the season, right? I'm still, still getting, uh, getting back in, in shape. Um, but it's the same thing. You know, you may think, well, I don't understand this now, but I'll just keep plugging away and, and it'll come clear. That's a risky approach because oftentimes what happens is it doesn't come clear and you're treading water and you're falling further behind um, and it's best to get the question answered. Now, one thing that I do in some cases is if I'm asked a question is I will, uh, in some cases, not necessarily give you a direct answer but maybe point you in the direction where you can discover the direct answer yourself. Um, that's sort of the best case scenario, right? And, uh, but, but again, depending on the question, depending on the problem, um, that's my job as a teacher to, to kind of provide uh, the appropriate level of assistance um, for that. All right. Canvas will be used extensively in this class, you know, so I don't have any handouts for you. Uh, all the materials will be in there. Um, I do post the videos from this class. Um, you are invited to, if you have a question, press the little button in front of you and then you get zoomed in on by the camera and your microphone goes on and you get to ask the question. Most people don't like to do that for whatever reason. Um, in which case I'll try to remember to repeat your question so that the microphone picks it up and uh, um, so that you can hear it on there. Um, I also post examples from this class. Um, sometimes um, stuff on the screen is hard to read. So a lot of times, um, you know, you can watch the video and hear the, the explanation, but I will also post the files so that you can look at and get a better understanding of that. I also post stuff between classes if it's relevant. Um, 
certainly announcements. Um, maybe if I misspoke in class or if I posted the wrong due date on an assignment, I'll post a correction and I'll post an announcement explaining that. If uh, for whatever reason I'm not going to be there for a certain class, if I have a doctor's appointment and I'm going to miss a class, I'll post that online. Um, sometimes people ask me questions in class or, or I'm working on something in class and I have a bug and I can't quite figure out what's wrong with it. Um, I'll take the time to figure it out and post the corrected version. So it's probably a good idea to check uh, between classes um, to Canvas, at least, you know, at least, you know, between Monday and Wednesday, and then again between uh, Wednesday and, and the, the following Monday when class is. The whole list of college policies that I'm not really going to get into. Late work. This is where I reserve the right to deduct for late work, but I also reserve the right not to deduct for late work. Uh, in me, there's two totally different situations. You know, I literally have students that are there for like the first couple weeks of class, disappear, and then at the end of the semester, come back and like turn in labs two, three, four, and so on. All right. In my mind, that's a different situation than students that are here every day are working on stuff in lab, are asking me questions, and maybe just aren't understanding something perfectly and takes them a little bit of time. Or students that are generally here, but they have to work overtime a particular week for whatever reason, inventory or some special cases coming up and, and, and they have to miss class because of that. In my mind, those are two different st situations. Students that um, are constantly late, without any sort of explanation versus students that are diligent and are working on it and it's clear that they're working on it but they've fallen a little bit, a little bit behind. Now, uh, and so I, I, I reserve the right to treat that differently. Now, a couple things. Um, if there is some sort of personal reason you have to miss class and you're going to be late for an assignment, I certainly don't want you to feel uncomfortable and, and like to tell me information that you're not comfortable in telling me. So if it's a personal matter, you don't have to go into detail. But simply keeping me in the loop, loop saying that, um, uh, you know, I'm going to be late on this assignment because I have a family situation or something like that. That's, that's completely acceptable, all right, to say something like that. Um, so you don't, you know, you don't have to go into details um, about what's going on, just a, a quick note like that. The other thing I will say is that if there's continuously a problem where each assignment you're getting late and maybe getting even later and later, that that's a sign that you should probably talk to me uh, and we, we need to figure out a plan to get you back on track. You know, so a late assignment, no big deal. Continuous late assignments, you probably want to address it um, with me. And certainly remain in contact with me. Um, you know, I don't need to know the personal details of your life, but if you are going to be late with assignments, um, you do owe some sort of, of explanation. All right. I essentially wrote all that up, and you can read that for your entertainment purposes as well. All right. Obviously, despite my proofreading, there's an error here because I have a total of 125 points. I don't think the midterm and final are the right number of points. I think they should be 10 and 15. In fact, let me go and correct that right now. It's amazing. Every term, I get the materials ready. Every term, I take one, like the last day before class, like yesterday, I take the time to proofread it just to make sure that I didn't have something wrong. And, and every term, there's something wrong that I forget. So this should be like this. There you go. So, there'll approximately be weekly assignments, five points each for a total of 75 points, 10 points for the midterm, 10 points for the final, and that should be a total of 100 points. It's possible that some assignments will be combined so there might be a two-week assignment that will be worth 10 points instead of two five-point assignments. It's also possible that we might be a little bit off and we might have only 70 points, let's say. If we do, then I prorate. I multiply your grades by 
75 over 70 in that case to prorate you up to 75 points. Um, so 75 points are, are the contribution of the assignments. 10 points for the midterm, 15 points for the final. This is one of the handful of classes that I teach where um, there are exams. Um, generally, I have projects. In this class, um, I think exams work better. Um, and so, you know, and so that's what I go with um, in this class. And again, 90, 80, 70, and all that will be the grades. This is a uh, um, week one, week two schedule um, for your readings. It's best if you read the material before class. All right, any questions about the syllabus? Keep in mind I'm hitting the highlights. It's, it's your responsibility to read through the details of it. Every week there'll be a module for the week. And that week will contain, um, at the very least, your assignment. This is the first assignment. And there'll be other materials in there as needed. Examples I go over in class, for example, will appear there. The videos from the class will appear there. All right, so every week there's, there's something. So if you miss a class, you can view the video and see the example. Any questions about this? Boy, this went quicker than it did in the morning class. Maybe I'm a little more awake. Or maybe I skipped a whole bunch of stuff because <laughs> I thought I went over it already and really I'm thinking about my earlier class. All right. The first thing I want to go over in this class is setting up your computer to run Java. All right. Unfortunate, well, our lab will be set up to run Java upstairs. Unfortunately, right at this minute, there's a problem with it. And we'll talk about the problem. We'll talk about what you need to do to correct it. So if you do want to go and run a sample Java program, like the sample that I am going over today or whatever, you can do that in lab. But there's something that you have to do. And we'll talk about that. All right. This computer has Java installed. So I, I can't really install Java on it. But one thing that you want to do right off is you want to install Java uh, on your computer so you can work on it. Now, there's a couple confusing things about it. Some people will say, I already have Java installed. Well, you may or may not. All right. There's actually, when, when, when you simply use the phrase, I have Java installed, you could be talking about two different things. Does anyone know what those two different things are? It's okay if you don't. I mean, this is a yes. Is it one's a reader and one's a writer? Uh, more or less, one's a reader, one's a writer. Um, we could elaborate on that a little bit. There is. Let me let me give you the initials. Maybe that will spark memory. JRE and JDK. Any idea what those mean? Yes. And not the not development kit, right? Yeah, the 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 J stands for Java, of course. Uh, the JDK is Java Development Kit, and the JRE stands for Java Runtime Environment. So. People that are simply running Java applications or like in the old days Java applets or something along those lines will have the JRE installed. So a lot of people have the JRE installed. All right. The JDK less people are going to have installed. All right. Um, and is for people that are going to be developing Java applications. All right. So. I believe if you don't have the JRE installed, when you install the JDK, it will install it for you, I believe. But if you have the JRE installed, you still need to install the JDK. 
So what do you do to install this? Because really that's one of our big things, uh, one of our big jobs the first week of class is make sure that you have your machine at home that you're going to work on, um, have it set up. Now again, the machines here will have it configured as well if you're, if you're using these machines, but for many people they want to have their own machine configured as well. So let's go up and let's look at install Java and how do I install Java? Or we could actually pick any of these. Just looking at this, well, it kind of tips us off. This is the JRE. So this would not be what you would want to install. We might be better off actually Googling, ah, developers. Downloading the JDK. Go to JDK Downloads. And again, there'll be a couple of options. We can just download this. You will click on it. It will go through a process of installing this for you. All right. You have a lot of different choices. This is one thing that can be confusing. Depending whether you have Mac OS, running Linux, running Windows 64-bit or 32-bit, you pick the choice of downloads. couple different versions that you have a choice for. Generally it would be better to pick, um, I guess in this case um, probably either of them would be okay. Um, not sure if like one is in, they give you the information here. Oh, uh, Probably it would be better to download the 102 one because it's a patch update including all of 801 plus some additional features. So you would click on this, download it, run the application and it should install your stuff. All right. Now, one thing that you need to do before Java works is you need to enable your path. All right. Does anyone know what that means to say enable or, or uh, add it to your path rather, not enable your path? And we have to add Java to the path. Does anyone know what the path is? All right. Any of you have done uh, CISS 125, the operating system class? A couple people? Did you do command line stuff in that? Okay. So you do command line stuff. What is command line? All right. Command line, go ahead. Was someone starting to answer or was that a cough? <laughs> All right, I think that was a cough. <laughs> command line is where you actually type in commands instead of using a GUI and click around. Um, it's like the old fashioned way of doing things. And actually it's the way that I am, at least for the beginning of the class, I'm going to want you to do things. Why? Because it really allows you to understand everything on a very nuts and bolts level. You really have to understand everything and have everything put together correctly if you're going to do it in command line. A lot of times when people use a GUI, like for example, or an uh, um, IDE, like uh, Visual Studio, people end up learning Visual Studio, but don't necessarily know all the ins and outs of the language. Whereas if you do things command line, you have to know everything to get it uh, to work. So let's talk a little bit about command line. How do you get to the command line? You type in CMD. And you are at this window. Is 
Is there anyone that has never done anything via the command line? It's OK. You can say, all right, so you should at least be a little bit familiar with that. All right. So I type in dir. What does dir do? Gives you a directory listing, shows you everything in the directory. All right. So it showed me everything that was in the directory that I'm currently in. How do I know what directory I'm in? It does tell you there in the breadcrumbs. Another way to do it is to type in pwd. <laughs> but not if you're on Windows. That's, I'm sorry, that's a Unix command. I, I blanked out on that. OK. So yeah, it tells you in the prompt what directory you're in. Um, I'm, I'm used to doing, I'm, I'm more used to doing um, um, Unix command line stuff. So I, I sometimes slip into that. Pardon me? Who am I? Oh. That tells you the user ID. Yeah. All right. At any rate, when I type in dir, how does it know that that's a command? It actually looks for the dir command along a path. All right. It starts off looking in your current directory. If it doesn't find it in the current directory, it looks at the first directory on the path. Then it looks at the second directory on the path. Then it looks on the third directory in the path. So how do you know what your path is? Well, you type in path. And it will show you all the directories it's going to look for when I type in a command. All right? So the command to compile a Java program is Java C. So if I type in Java C, since I didn't type in the name of a program, it gave me all the possible options. That means that Java is correctly installed on this machine because it was able to find the Java C command. So when you go up to lab today, if you go, if we go up into BU212 or whatever that is, you go to a terminal and, and, and go into command line mode and type in Java C, it will probably give you an error. All right. Why will it give you an error? Well, if you type in path, you'll see that the dire uh, Java directory is not on the path. Well, how do you add something to the path? Any ideas? I think I know, but you know uh, who knows for sure? Google knows for sure. So I go in and type in into Google. Add to path. Windows, what is this? This isn't 10. Windows 7, maybe? And it'll tell me how to do it. All right. So you'll need to do this, except if you're doing it on the machine up there, it'll be Windows 10. Now, it'll probably be the same thing. So I go to the computer icon. Go to Properties. Advanced System Settings, Environment Variables, and I look down here, and there's the path. And I can type at it, and then I can put the path that Java was installed in. It really doesn't matter that much where you put it. I usually put it at the beginning. It would only matter where you would put the path if that command existed in two different places. All right, if Java C existed in two different directories. Like, for example, if you had two different versions of Java installed on your machine. Then it would matter which directory you put Java uh, or that you, that you, that you put in the path. 
Now, how do you know where it's going to install it? Well, if you pay attention to the install process, it tells you. But it's more than likely going to put it in C colon program files, Java, JDK, bin. So you can actually navigate to that. You can click on that, and that gives you the actual path written out. And you can just go copy that and go paste that into the beginning of the path. Now, you don't want to replace what's in the path with that, because that will screw up the operating system, right? That will make it forget all the other things, directories in its path. You want to add this to the path. So you put this at the beginning, a semicolon, and let the rest of it go. So I would copy this, go in the path, click Edit. I would go to the very beginning, paste it in, and then put a semicolon there. All right? Um, it's not going to matter that I have two things, that I have it in there twice. It's just going to find it, you know, in one of them. Now, if we look at Windows 10, there'll be similar instructions. System control panel applet, start settings control panel system. Select the advanced tab, click the environment, and then essentially you do the same thing. So that's actually good practice for you today if you go upstairs is to go and it should already be sort of installed, but the path environment variable is not set. Now if you have another operating system, Linux or Mac operating system or whatever, there will be a similar sort of thing that you'll have to research for your particular operating system and find. All right? So that'll be, that'll be something you can play around in lab today. And again, it's sort of you, you want to make sure your machine is set up to allow you to do it. All right. Let's now look at a Java program. All right, let's, let's do the classic Hello World Java program. Uh, except we're going to do an Ivy League Princeton version of it. I actually found a link on Princeton's site, and I figured, yeah, might as well use that. One thing about Canvas, by the way, if you get an error like this, just click on just click on the heading. It's simply, this is HTTPS. The link to this is simply HTTP. So it's complaining about security. But if you just click on that, you're OK. First of all, everything in, in Java is, is, for the most part, with a handful of exceptions only, but it's object-oriented. Therefore, all your code is going to live in some class. All right? You'll have at least one class no matter what program you have, even the simplest program like this, the Hello World program. All right? So I'm going to copy this, and I'm going to make a class. And you can use whatever plain, simple text editor you want to. A lot of people use Notepad++. You can use Notepad. You can use Text Wrangler, Komodo. There's a number of good text editors, but we're not using a GUI to do this. We're simply going to use a plain old text editor. So because it's available on every Windows machine, I'm going to fire up Notepad. And I'm going to paste my code in there. All right. Now I'm going to save it. Then we're going to go and run it and look at it. And then we'll take some time to sort of dissect this. All right. How, what am I going to save it under? Notice that the name of the class is Hello World. Notice a couple things about this. Um, because you want to follow convention with Java. There's sort of, um, how do I want to say, there's sort of a convention about naming things in Java. And the names of classes are capitalized. All right? So 
Hello World has a capital H and has a capital W. So each initial letter is capitalized. Notice other things are not capitalized in here. And we'll talk about those going forward. But public class, hello world, means that's the name of this class. The Java source code should be in a file that matches the name of the class and has a .java extension. So I'm going to go and save this on the desktop. So I'm going to go up under File and say Save. I'm going to go to the desktop. I'm going to change this where it says Save File Type as Text File to Change File as All Files. And then I'm going to save it as Hello World dot java so that the name of the file matches the name of the class and ends in dot java with a couple of exceptions that we'll talk about later on in the class should be one class per file and that class should be the name of or the file should be the name of the class dot java all right So I saved it on the desktop under the name Hello World Java. This is what's called the source code. What does it mean when we say the source code of a program? What does the source code of a program mean? Again, it's okay if you haven't used these terms before. Depending on what you've done, maybe you haven't. Source code is the file that you as a programmer works on. So it's the file in whatever programming language you're using. So it's the file that contains the Java code. All right. How is that different than any other program? Well, files, source code files, need to be compiled to produce a version of the program that the computer can execute. And that is called object code in many cases. In the case of Java, it's called byte code. Let me go in and we will talk about compiling this code, running it. Then we'll explain exactly what happened. So I want you to see the compilation process. I want to see you, uh, show you it running. And then we'll go back and we'll analyze and see exactly what happened. So I have my source code in hello world.java. That's this file here that contains these Java instructions. We haven't talked about any of these yet, but it's there. So I need to get in the folder. So I will type in CD desktop. And now I'm in the desktop folder. So now I can compile it. How do I compile it? I type in Java C. Then I type in the name of the class file. Hello world dot java it does its thing and notice it didn't give me any output that means it worked all right another way we can tell it worked is there are now two files one that ends in dot java and one that ends in dot class so in other words We take our source code, which is in .java, we compile it by saying Java C, and then the file name, and that produces our byte code, which ends in a .class extension.
Okay. This is the code that actually gets executed. All right. So how do I execute that program? I type in Java, and I type in then Java Hello World. I don't need the dot class extension. I can just type in Java Hello World, and it goes and it outputs Hello World. A lot of work just to get that message out, but again, it's a learning experience. All right. Let's make sure that we understand the process here again. Source code gets compiled to byte code, which is a dot class file. This gets executed. Now the question comes, what executes the byte code? Actually, the computer doesn't directly execute it. The Java virtual machine executes it. What's the Java virtual machine? It's a program. It's a program that we get when we type in Java. And it allows any machine in the world to run Java, provided there's a Java virtual machine associated with it. What is one of the biggest advantages of Java? One of the biggest advantages of Java is it's cross-platform compatible, which means I could run this on Linux. I could run the same code. I don't have to recompile. All right? Doesn't matter what kind of machine I have, I could take that Java class file, that hello world.class file, and give it to someone running Linux or Windows or Mac operating system or some brand new operating system that someone just created last week or whatever. And they could execute it provided they have downloaded the Java virtual machine. That is the Java runtime environment. So what we have really, if we're going to close the loop here, the last of this is this becomes input to the Java virtual machine, which runs the program and produces the output. Programs that you write, again, when you write a, a program in any number of programming languages, computers don't directly understand them. They have to be translated into a form that the computer does understand. And depending on the hardware, there's certain machine code that runs on a computer. And you can write in that machine code, and it's very efficient, but it's very difficult for humans to use. So we've developed these techniques to write in a little more understandable format and then have it translated into the way that uh, uh, the computer can understand. All right. So this is written in whatever the native machine language is. So this is running on the hardware's machine code. So this is going to be an EXE file, a Windows program. My program gets coded into the sort of an intermediary step, a class file, and then it can run on that machine because the machine reads this code and processes it and produces the output. Again, what is the chief advantage of that? The chief advantage of that is that it allows for cross-platform because I can take the same dot class files and run them on different kinds of machines with different machine languages and different hardware. All right. So, we look at the Java file. It's very English language-like. We can understand that. If we look at the class file, it's probably not even going to let me open it. I'm going to, I'm going to tell it to open it up in Notepad. That's what the class file looks like. 
Because again, that's not meant for human consumption. This is a format more of what the computer understands. So, the recipe is you create the file, the Java file, using a text editor. You write your Java code. You compile it to get a class file or files. You then run the Java virtual machine on the class file or files to actually run your program. Now let's take a minute to look at this here. First of all, all this stuff from the slash star to the star slash is simply comments. So this is just explanation of the program. Um, it tells you how to compile it. It tells you how to execute it and so on. All our code is going to be within classes. So the first thing that we have is we have a declaration of a class with these braces indicating grouping. All right. Here we have a public class. These are keywords. And again, the case is important. If I put in a P for public, it would give me an error. All right. Public means that other classes can access it. Hello world is the name of the class. So public, class, these are keywords, the name of the class. I then have a starting bracket and then I have an ending bracket. This is what's called a method or sometimes a function. Those can be used interchangeably. Or interchangeably. Every program that you run will have at least one class that has a public method named main. And they will all look like this. And we'll go over the exact meaning of these words in a future class. But any program you run is going to say public, static, void, main. It's going to have at least one class that has a method that looks exactly like that. What you have in the parentheses are optional arguments for this function. And then you have braces that surround the function. Now notice how neat this code is. You can at a glance see that this brace belongs to this function declaration and this brace belongs, I'm sorry, this brace belongs to this class declaration and this brace belongs to this function declaration. If I forgot one of them or if I had an extra one in here, then my code would not compile. System out print ln is simply a way to output to your standard output, which is your screen, something. In this case, it outputs the words hello world. Ideally, between now and Wednesday, you will do two things. Number one, go upstairs and fix your machine upstairs to have the proper path so that you can compile and run this program. And then make sure your machine at home is set up to run Java. So install the JDK and in, uh, make sure your path set up. And be able to do what I just did right here. That is, create my hello world.java file, copy and paste the text in there, save it as hello world.java, compile it, and run it. If you can do that by Wednesday, you're in good shape and we can move forward from there. If you have any difficulty with that, let me know. All right, any questions? All right, we'll see you up in lab.